Okay, the topic of this video is going to be something called internal standards. Internal standards. Um, I think this topic is, is important for you to understand. Um, you may or may not see it on your exam. I've kind of given it two out of four stars importance uh, for your standardized exam. Um, however, um, we're going to work a sample problem in a little bit. And uh, the general spirit of this problem in terms of its quantitative nature um, is, is probably good to understand and, and good to be able to do for your exam. It's, it's somewhat representative of a problem that you might see. Okay? It involves several steps um, and you have to have a good understanding of what's going on uh, to be able to solve the problem. So while you may not see an exact problem based on internal standards on a standardized exam, um, it, it is good to understand that this exists and, and understand what it is, okay? So let's talk about that uh, for a few minutes. So this topic is usually taught in the chapter of your analytical chemistry sequence that has to do with uh, calibration of methods. And the reason why is because an internal standard, or abbreviated here IS, is a known amount of a chemical compound that is not the analyte that is purposely added to an unknown sample. So the internal standard is some other chemical compound. It is not the analyte. It's chemically different. It may be a different substance. Uh, it could possibly be an isotopically labeled version of your analyte that you can distinguish in your method as being um, you know, isotopically different. But it is not the analyte that you're trying to measure, okay, in your original sample. And that's important to know about internal standards because we are going to spike our sample with the internal standard, but we're adding this different substance. So it's not the same as standard additions, which is another video in this series. The general idea for why we would ever want to add an internal standard is that the measurement signal for an analyte and the internal standard on the device we use to make our measurements, whether that's a chromatograph, um, atomic absorption spectrometer, uh, any different uh, instrument that you might use in lab. The idea is, is that the signals for the analyte and the, the um, internal standard are going to scale linearly with one another. So as one gets bigger, the other will get bigger. And the reason why this is important in analytical chemistry is we can use this linear scaling relationship to correct for variability when using methods whose response will change slightly from run to run. Okay, this is a very common use of internal standards. And a common example of such a uh, sort of subcategory of, of techniques that's surreal is in gas chromatography. In gas chromatography, you might use a syringe that, that looks a lot like this one, okay? Um, in fact, uh, it would be typical to use volumes that are, are smaller than this. This is a 100 microliter syringe. The whole, the whole thing can hold a 100 microliters of sample. It's, it's not uncommon to inject way less than even 10 microliters in, in GC, but the syringe would look the same. It would just have a, a slightly smaller um, diameter plunger, and the volume would, would be lower. Um, but when you inject sample into a gas chromatograph, usually what you do is you draw that sample into a syringe like this, okay? And then you actually uh, take the needle, put it into the gas chromatograph, pierce the septum, and then depress the plunger to introduce your sample into the chromatograph. Well, that's, that's a wonderful way to introduce sample, but there's a little bit of a problem with it. No matter how hard you try, from run one to run two to run three, there's going to be some variability in the amount of sample that you add to the chromatograph. In other words, you, you can never get, even though you try to put it always at you know, 2 or 20 microliters or whatever it is you're injecting, there's always going to be a little bit of variability. You're not going to inject the same volume from run to run to run. So the idea is, is that we could use some other substance, an internal standard, add it to our sample, and then when we inject with our syringe, we compare, say, an imaginary or hypothetical run one with run two, okay? Well, maybe in run one, you inject this much sample on a hypothetical scale of, of how much it's injected, okay? So more or less injected sample. And then in run two, you just so happen to inject a little bit more, okay? So a higher amount. Well, what's going to happen in our data readout, our chromatogram, as it's called, which is of course detector signal 
plotted in time for chromatography experiment. So these axes are all the same. Detector signal plotted in time. What will happen is the peaks that you see in run one, well you might get two peaks. Maybe this is for your analyte and this is for your internal standard IS. They produce different peaks because they're different substances. Okay, But if you compare run one with run two what will happen is because you injected more sample in run two, you're, you're going to get bigger peaks. Okay, I'll overlap that one just to <laughs> emphasize this. Now, this is still the analyte, and this is still the internal standard. In fact, you're injecting the same sample in run one and run two, the identical samples. You just injected more in run two, so the peaks get bigger. Okay, but the beauty of this is, is that the idea is is that the internal and an uh, standard and analyte peaks scale linearly with one another. Okay? And that's important because if I inject more sample, the peaks get bigger. And from the relationship between the peak sizes, I can kind of correct for this variability in injection volumes. Now let's see how we're going to do that. The way that's done is they're using the equations that are shown up here on this slide, okay? I've pre-written a lot of this material just in the interest of time to explain it quickly in this video. You can always kind of re-watch the video if you need to, okay? The key equation for using internal standards is here at the top of this slide. I'm going to box it in for you, okay? It's basically a series of ratios that are uh, modified a little bit by this, this term F, which we'll talk about here in a second. It's going to be a response factor. But other than this F term, which will also make sense eventually, this equation makes perfect sense logically, okay? If we look over here on the left of the equal sign, we have analyte signal divided by concentration of analyte. Well, analyte signal is the signal produced at our detector. It's peak height, the peak area, something like that. We're going to divide that by the concentration of the analyte, okay? So this is just the ratio of the signal to the concentration for one of the, the peaks in our chromatogram or one of our signals. That one has to do with the analyte, what we're trying to measure. Over on the far right, then, is another ratio, signal to concentration, but this one has to do with the internal standard, IS. So the internal standard signal produced at a detector divided by the concentration of the internal standard. Now the only other term in this equation is F. Now, if our detector was equally sensitive to the analyte and the internal standard, in other words, if we had equal concentrations of analyte and internal standard, F would just be 1 and it wouldn't be there. Okay, It would just go away. But in most cases, detectors are, are, have a bias towards one substance compared to the other. In other words, the sensitivity of that detector is not equal for two different substances. Okay. It might be more sensitive towards the analyte. It might be more sensitive to the internal standard. We don't really know. So we have to introduce this term F, which is called the response factor. It's kind of like a fudge factor or a constant that accounts for the fact that the method that we're using or the detector that we're using does not likely respond equally to the analyte and the internal standard. There might be a difference in sensitivity. So F accounts for that difference. Okay? Now, Usually when we're going into a problem, we don't know what that response factor is. And one of our first goals is actually to try to solve for F, to figure out what that response factor is. Okay? If we're doing an analysis, we have to do that. We can accomplish figuring out what F is by running a sample of known concentration for both our, our analyte and our internal standard. We'll see that in the sample problem in a second. But that's the response factor. We've got to figure out that what that is. It's crucial to work in these types of problems. Another thing that I want to mention about this equation, okay, and it's kind of important to keep track of this. The concentrations of the analyte and the concentration of the internal standard that's written in this equation are for the analyzed sample. This is not for something that you dilute. It's not for an original sample. It's whatever you inject into your device that makes your measurement. The concentrations that you write here and here should be whatever is in that sample that you actually analyze. Okay? That's important. But nonetheless, this is our quantitative basis for solving um, these types of internal standard types of problems.
So what I'd like to do now is just to kind of demonstrate or show you a sample problem that you could you know, potentially encounter in an analytical chemistry class. And, um, this type of problem is, is one that um, I've seen given to my students in, in my classes before. That's why I've kind of um, highlighted it here. It's, it's typical of an internal standard type of problem. It's actually a reasonably uh, complicated or complex one. So it's good for us to work through it. And again, I've pre-written a lot of this stuff just to save time. Okay. So the problem reads that cobalt 2 ion, aqueous ion, is used as an internal standard to analyze a sample of titanium through atomic absorption spectroscopy. A standard is prepared that contains 1.52 micrograms of cobalt per milliliter and 1.04 micrograms per milliliter of titanium. This standard then produced a reading of 3.98 for titanium and a reading of 2.0 for cobalt on the atomic absorption instrument used. After that occurred, a sample was prepared by combining 4 milliliters of a solution that contained an unknown concentration of titanium with 4 milliliters of solution that contains 10.7 microgram per milliliter of cobalt. The signal produced for this sample was 0.158 for titanium and 0.195 for cobalt. We want to know what is the molarity of titanium in the original sample. Now when you read this problem, I think historically it's been very easy for students to kind of get overwhelmed with information. So it, it's always a good idea to read through it back again and try to start uh, categorizing or, or classifying the information that you're given, trying to start understanding what's important, what's not, and, and why you're given information that you are. It's not um, atypical to have problems that um, give you a lot of extraneous information that's not necessarily all that important. Like for instance here, we're analyzing through atomic absorption. To the quantitative parts of this problem, that, that's really not all that important. It's just the method that's being used, okay? Um, the fact that we're, we're analyzing for cobalt or titanium, it, it's not really important. I mean, it could be iron and lead, but what is important is which one's the analyte and, and which one is the internal standard. So, you know, this first sentence tells us basically that cobalt is, is our IS. So I'm also, as I'm starting to mark up this problem, I might make a mental note of that, that cobalt is my standard, and that means that titanium is ultimately going to be my analyte. That's what I want to know for the concentration of, and, and in fact, at the end down here, you know, that's what I'm asked, okay? So that confirms that. So those bits of information are useful, okay? Again, as I'm thinking through this, what, what other information am I uh, given here? Well, I'm told that I run a standard, the concentration of cobalt is this, the concentration of titanium in that standard is this, okay? These are the concentrations in that standard, which is also important. Okay, don't lose sight of that. And then that standard, when it was analyzed, produced this signal for the titanium and a signal of 2 for the cobalt on the instrument we used via the method that we used. Okay? And that's important. Now, why is that information crucial to us? Well, remember back when I told you the quantitative or the equation that we're going to use to solve these equation, or, uh, internal standard type problems. I said that very often we have to solve for F and we do that through using a standard solution. Well guess what? All this information that they just gave us in this first paragraph is sufficient to solve for F. Now why is that? Well, looking ahead a little bit, I know my two substances. I know my internal standard which is going to go on the right side. I know my analyte information which goes over here on the left. My standard concentration for cobalt, which was my internal standard, was 1.52. That can go right here for concentration of ions. My concentration for titanium in that standard goes down here for the concentration of the analyte. The analyte signal, well, that's my reading for titanium. That was 3.98. That goes right here. My internal standard signal, that's the reading for the cobalt. That 2 goes up here. Okay, so I got this number, this number, this number, this number. I know everything except F. I'm going to be able to rearrange and solve for F. So the purpose of this first paragraph and the problem was just to give you information to solve for the response factor. Okay, that, that's basically all this information was. And um, this is why I'm kind of encouraging you to, to read through the problem carefully and also work many of these examples because 
once you start to work examples, you start to understand what they're communicating, okay? If I've never worked an example like this before, I don't know that that's what they're telling me in this first paragraph. They're just giving me all this information. I can't make sense of it. But the more you see it by working these practice problems, the more it makes sense, okay? The second paragraph, then, if I'm reading on after this, okay, so there's a division there, right? A sample was prepared by combining four mils of a solution containing an unknown concentration of titanium with four mils of a solution that contains this concentration of cobalt. So they're basically telling us how to prepare the sample here. So I like to draw pictures whenever I can to keep track of things. So I've drawn a little beaker here with some fluid in it. So I've got four milliliters of a titanium solution and I've got four milliliters of 10.7 micrograms per milliliter cobalt. That's my IS, my internal standard. So this is going to be eight milliliters total. I'm going to take that sample after I mix it. I'm going to analyze it by the same exact method of atomic absorption spectroscopy that I used to uh, get this calibration data. It's important that it's the same method because if you change the method, if you change um, specific uh, characteristics of the detector or um, you change settings on your instrument, that could change the response function. Okay, So you don't want to do that. You don't want to change F. It has to be exactly the same method. And that's what we're going to have here, exactly the same method. But if I analyze the sample, I get this signal for titanium, this signal for the cobalt. Okay. We want to know what is the concentration in moles per liter of the titanium in the original sample. All right, so let's work our way through this. It's essentially a, a two-part problem. You might even consider it a, a three-part problem eventually, as it turns out, um, just because of the way this particular one's set up. And we'll explain that as we go, OK? But all of these problems are essentially going to be a two-part problem. The first part of the problem is going to be to understand what's going on in that standard. Okay, what in the world's going to go on in that standard? So, up here at the top is the information that I have specific to the standard. Now, now remember in the problem, we were told information in that first paragraph, and I said that that was going to be useful to find F. Mathematically, this is how it's done up here at the top. Okay, now what have I done here? Well, I draw myself a picture at first because I like to keep track of my thoughts in terms of pictures. It just helps me personally so I don't lose track of all this information that they're given to me. If I draw it out, it just makes more sense to me. It's like I'm having it, a beaker in my hand and I'm really in lab doing this work, okay? So what I've gone up here is I've summarized the information that was given to me in the problem. I said, okay, the concentration of the cobalt, which is the internal standard, is 1.52 micrograms per milliliter, the concentration of titanium in that sample that I analyzed for my standardization to find F was 1.04 micrograms per milliliter. The signals that I received at my detector were 3.98 and 2 for titanium and cobalt respectively. Through knowledge of the internal standard equation which was presented on that previous slide, I can then start filling in numbers for everything as I alluded to earlier. For instance, this left side of the equation is for my titanium. That's my analyte, I have my titanium signal in the numerator, my titanium concentration in the denominator. On the far right, I've got my signal and my concentration for my internal standard, the cobalt. That's my signal, my uh, in, uh, concentration in the standard that I analyze. Now, of course, what this allows us to do is to now numerically solve this equation for F. Of course, the F is my response function, my response function. I do the division here, get this number, do my division here, get this number, algebraically rearrange to find for F, 2.908. The first you will find very often, if you're not given F in the problem, very often they're going to give you information to solve for F, and that's going to be your first step. Why is that important? Because it tells you the ratio of signals that your detector will produce assuming the concentration of the two substances are equal. you got to figure that out because at first you don't know whether it produces an equal response or it doesn't. And the most uh, common case is you won't get equal responses at your detector. There's nothing that says 
that the detector has to produce equivalent responses for two different substances. And in fact, usually you don't get that. So by using the information in the first paragraph, I was able to plug and chug into my um, IS equation to solve for my response function. After I do that, I can move on to the next part of this problem. Now that I know my F is equal to 2.908, I can rewrite that into my IS equation. Okay, I can rewrite that into my IS equation. As long as I do not change the conditions of my measurement, that will not change. All right, and that's kind of the beauty here. We assume that that's a constant once I determine it. I can use that knowledge then to solve for the unknown concentration of my sample. Now going back to my problem again, let's read through it again just to remind ourselves what's going on. A sample was prepared by combining 4 milliliters of a solution containing an unknown concentration of titanium plus 4 milliliters of a solution containing a concentration of cobalt, that's 10.7 micrograms per mil. So we're mixing two things together, getting a total volume of 8 milliliters that came from an aqueous solution that contained titanium and an aqueous solution that contains some cobalt. So we're mixing those two together and assuming the volume is additive to get us to the 8 milliliters. We then have signals for cobalt, signals for titanium. Again, this is using the same exact device. And based on these, these signals that we observe, we now want to know the unknown concentration of the titanium. Okay? So this is part two of the problem. Part one was using our standardization data to figure out F. Part two figuring out an unknown concentration. How do we do that? We return to the exact same equation that we used up here at the top to find F. It's always that internal standard equation. But note, the information that's in this equation now is different. Now we solved for what F was, and we're going to use this equation to solve for X, which is going to be our unknown analyte concentration, because we don't know what that is in our sample. So first step, Standardization, find F. Second step, use the knowledge of F to figure out what an unknown concentration actually is. All right? That's part two of this equation. So what we're going to do here is we're going to set up these ratios again. This is our analyte side. This is our internal standard side, same as it was above. The analyte signal, which is the signal for titanium, was 0.158. We're going to divide that by X, which is our variable. That's our unknown. We don't know what that is. That corresponds to the concentration of the titanium in our sample. And we need to figure that out. All right? That's this whole protocol. That's what we're doing here. On the right side, signal divided by concentration. Now we know the signal was 0.195. We're given that in the problem. We have to divide that by the concentration here of the cobalt because that's our internal standard. That's what we're using for our internal standard. Now if you're following along closely, you're confused by this number. And the reason why is because if we look back to the problem, the problem tells us the concentration was 10.7 micrograms per milliliter of the cobalt. However, this concentration of cobalt corresponds to the solution that we mixed in this beaker. Remember we added 4 milliliters of that into the beaker? And we mixed that with 4 milliliters of our sample, which contained the titanium. So the total volume is now 8. Everybody see that? That's important. If I dilute my standard down, the concentration is going to be reduced. It will no longer be 10.7. So I'm going to have to account for that. Now in this particular example, it, it's reasonably easy to do that. okay? Because I mixed 4 mils of this with 4 mils of this. So I'm basically diluting my cobalt standard in half from 4 milliliters to 8 milliliters, okay? which halves the concentration. I double the volume, half the concentration. So that's how I got this number, 5.35 here, because it's exactly half of this 10.7. Okay, you can use this whole C1, V1, C2, V2 dilution equation, which is also very important for your exams in analytical chemistry. You need to memorize that one and know how to use it. Okay, but that's basically how I got this number. The concentration's cut in half. So that's how I got that. But with that said, I can now do my math in this equation, solve for x. This just becomes an algebra problem. So I can divide this out, multiply by this, multiply both sides by x, 
and that yields that statement right there. And then I could do my division solve for x. And when I do that, x is equal to 1.49 micrograms per mil. It will have the same units as the concentration of units I've used to generate my F and my um, concentration here. So let's think for a second, reflect upon what that number is once you solve. And that's important. Don't lose sight of what these numbers are. So it's my x, the number that went here. Wasn't that the concentration of my titanium in units of milli or micrograms per milliliter? And I would agree with you that that's correct. But you need to be more careful than that. You need to specify what solution this concentration is representative of. In other words, if I, if I went in the, in the lab and I, I found a solution that, that this is the concentration of titanium within, what, what would it be? Would it be my original sample, my standard? What would it be? Okay. Well, wh the answer is that this number that we solve for is the concentration that is representative of the sample which was analyzed, which was added to our detector to produce these signals. And if you think about it very quickly, you arrive at the fact that this mixture in that beaker is the sample that was analyzed. Within this volume, the concentration of titanium it should be 1.49 micrograms per milliliter. Okay? Now, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. And this is probably something that you did not pay much attention to in the original problem, going back to the original sample problem. Okay? Sample problem, slide. What did they ask us for? They asked us to solve for the concentration of titanium in the original sample. They also highlighted what units to use to give or report our answer. It's not micrograms per milliliter either, it's molarity or moles per liter. So that's important because if I report my answer just in micrograms per milliliter, I'm going to get the wrong response. I'll get it marked incorrect. And in addition, this is important as well. I want to know something about my original sample. This is not my original sample. It's 1.49. That's the sample that I analyzed. So I need to solve for what the concentration is, is in the original sample that I added to make this one. Okay, now how was this made? Well, four milliliters plus four milliliters make eight milliliters. So I think we're kind of onto something here and we see that we need to use the dilution equation again to help us. Move that out of the way. The original or the sample that we analyzed had this concentration of titanium. To account for dilution, we take this concentration multiplied by the volume of that sample. Remember it was 8 milliliters, the 4 plus 4. And that has to be equal to x, the concentration in the original, times 4, because we used 4 milliliters of the original solution. Quickly doing the math, we see that we have to double the concentration to solve for x. So the correct concentration in the original sample or the original solution is 2.98 micrograms per milliliter. That's, of course, of our analyte, the titanium. As I mentioned earlier, we also want molarity, not this unit. So we need to convert. Now, this type of conversion, you need to be careful for on your standardized exam. It is very common that they work this type of unit conversion into problems. The problem at first glance that you encounter may seem very simple and very straightforward, but you, boy, you need to watch the units that they're asking for the answer in because it's pretty common that they make you do this type of uh, conversion, unit conversion on the end, just to make sure that, that they know that you've mastered that because it's an important skill. So let's work our way through that. If we need to go from micrograms per milliliter to molarity, how would we do this? We start out with a 2.98 micrograms per milliliter, and it's just a unit conversion. The first thing that I've chosen to do here is to convert away from milliliter units, so they cancel out, and towards liter units. Okay, so I've gone from milliliters to liters by multiplying by a thousand. 
The next thing I've done is I've gone to grams instead of micrograms. Okay, because we want to go to molarity and it's uh, easy to use grams uh, to go to moles on the second step. Um, so what I've done here is I've gotten rid of my micrograms, went directly to grams by dividing by a million. The net result of that is, is that 2.98 micrograms per milliliter is the same as 0 0.00298 grams per liter of solution. Okay, so I've changed my units. And then in the last step of the conversion, I take the 0 0.00298 grams per liter and I convert to molarity. The way that I do that is I know that one mole is equivalent to 47.87 grams of titanium. Where did I get this number from? It wasn't in the problem. That's from the periodic table of the elements. Okay, it's just the molar mass of titanium. So I divide by that. Find the final concentration or the molarity of titanium in the original sample was 6.22 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter. That then becomes my answer to my original sample problem. Okay? So I know it might have been a little bit long-winded. It may feel that way, okay? But I wanted to work you through this again because when you look at this problem, it's very easy to be overwhelmed with information that they give you. But you got to really break it down and work uh, some examples of these so you know what they're telling you. I mean, I've seen this before, and when I see this paragraph, I quickly identify it. Okay, it's my signals, it's my concentration for that um, standard solution where I know the concentration of the internal standard. I know the concentration of the analyte, and I'm finding my F, my response function, okay? That's the whole purpose of this whole paragraph. Then they give me information about the unknown solution that I want to know the concentration of the analyte in. I have my two signals. I have some information given to me about the concentration of my internal standard. Whether I need to correct that for dilution, maybe I do, maybe I don't. You've got to read the problem carefully, okay? And then after that, I've got to identify what specifically are they asking me. And I always encourage you, when you're reading problems on your exam, identify specifically what they're asking you. What is the exact unit of measure that they want the answer in? All of that can be important, okay? So don't be tricked um, by answering the incorrect uh, response because you didn't pay close enough attention to the units. Okay, so the key ideas here um, in terms of guiding your study, this equation, of course, is very, very crucial to your success. If you don't know the equation, um, you're a little bit out of luck. If you don't know the equation or how to derive it, um, you may not be able to do um, the quantitative parts of problems like this, if that exists on your standardized exam. Um, you probably can rationalize out the equation if you think about it long enough. Um, it's one of those equations you can think about and rationalize out. In addition to that, you probably want to know at least what an internal standard is useful for in analytical chemistry. I mean, that's a key learning objective for this particular um, topic. Um, we want to know that we can use internal standards um, to more or less correct for variabilities uh, from experimental run to run. And that's frequently done in that example that I gave you, right, with the gas chromatography injecting the sample uh, between one and run one and run two. You may not get exactly the same volume, okay? So it's not uncommon um, to have to use internal standards. Um, and that's why I put this video together so you understand more or less what this is all about. So with that said, it brings this video to a conclusion. I hope that you found it useful. We'll see you next time.